Can you just project and pick it from this one? Some of the I wish right now those um, three travelers Ellen, Kevin, and so. Four posters for sure, and there would be another spot if no one can use the first spot. It's absolute cost to the service. Let's make a quick way of run. Here are the compels. This is starting from Ellen. David, if you So if you spend about 20 minutes per post, it will be reasonable. So, we'll try for here. Um, the plan is to have a very, very final uh, version by the Wednesday night in 13 hours from now. It's uh, sent to 
Thank you, Dave. So in our group, we're primarily focused on photo-induced dynamics and semiconductor materials, and the material that I specifically focus on for most of my projects are lead halide perovskites. And these lead halide perovskites are interesting both for applications and in terms of theoretical modeling, because for applications, they've shown to kind of overtake the photovoltaic industry. It's going commercial in roughly about 10 years. So they show very high efficiencies. For photovoltaics, and they also show good efficiencies for light emission as well. And in terms of photo induced processes, is one of the ways that people have rationalized their use of photovoltaics is that once you they're photo excited, you have an electron and hole, they interact with the lattice and form polarons. And so, and polarons can be visualized. With these couple of images I have in the introduction here. So, in this case, this is just a hole, so we remove an electron. And then the, the hole density are the colored contours. And what happens is once you put the charge in, the lattice is soft, so there's a lot of nuclear reorganization. And there's enough to influence the, or to create like bound states. And those can be visualized with this little diagram here. So. So the blue lines essentially represent like a, a Coulomb interaction or a Coulomb potential from the ionic lattice. And it creates a little potential well where the where the charge carrier goes to the bottom or minimum. And another interesting fact is that since it's a Coulomb potential, the internal states are should be analogous to like hydrogenic transitions. And what we primarily focus on in this poster are optical transitions within this little optical or within this potential well and then non-radiative dynamics within the internal excited states within the potential well. So that's essentially the overview of what I'm going to be presenting. And so the ultimate goal is to model both electron and hole simultaneously as polarons, but we decided to take baby steps towards that. So we first just do a ne negative polaron by injecting a charge or just a positive polaron by removing a charge from, from our model and looking at the observables we want with those first before going at first into simultaneous positive and negative. So essentially the flow chart for how we conduct our work is, so for each model there's an equilibrium, equilibrium number of charges and then we modify that by adding or removing charges. So if we remove a charge that creates positive polaron, add charge creates a negative polaron. So we change the charge, throw it into the DFT to get the reorganization re of the nuclei. And then, then we characterize the change in nuclear positions and that effect on the optical spectra and the non-radiative dynamics of material. And in terms of talking about the dynamics, there are two potential ways that you could think about them. So you create, so you put the charge in, and one opposite extreme is that the lattice instantly reorganizes faster than that energy can dissipate. So in that case, you'd have a hot pull around. So we would have, our charge would be stuck in the top of the potential well. Or you have the opposite effect where you put the charge in, it gets rid of all this energy, and then the nuclei organized and that would be a cold polar so that would be this uh, charge stuck in the bottom well 
And so the way that we've set up our dynamics is we are simulating hot columns so that we can look at radiative and non-radiative transitions of the excited state. And from there, so our methods, some um, uh, technical details about how we did our calculations. Most um, pressing thing is that for material considerations that we deal with lead orbitals, lead P orbitals, and those have high angular momentum. So we have to include spin orbit coupling into the calculation. And then that took some work to extend that to our non ready dynamics. So that's kind of a, one of the methodological methodological novelties of this work. And so essentially the main interaction that we have to deal with in describing polarons is the electron phonon interactions. So from this fancy sec second quantization description, you can break it into two types of terms. So you can deal with uh, organate or dealing with the same indice terms. So that essentially describes nuclear reorganization or just movement along the potential energy surface. So that would be essentially what we do, how we do our direct geometry optimization. Then you have these uh, transitions between different bands, and those are described by non adiabatic terms. And then that's how we describe the dynamics. And so, so that's methodology out of the way. And so we look at structural characteristics of the polaron. We use the radial distribution functions for each system, so for the positives and the negatives. And in this, we only look at the coordination between lead and bromines. That's illustrated with this picture here. So A is a lead to bromine bond distance, where B is a bromine to bromine, bromine coordination distance, which is across the the lattice. And for both models, we see specific characteristic nuclear organization. So for the positives, we see that there's really no change in the, in the light bromine bond, but the bromine-bromine coordinations are increased. And so that indicates that these octahedra, there's no change in elongation, but they kind of rotate so that bromines are interacting more. Whereas with the negative polaron, we don't see a change in the bromine-bromine coordination, but we see a change in the bond distances themselves, and we see a little bit of an elongation of those bonds. And we just rationalize that due to, if you consider, when you add a charge, they're mostly localized on light orbitals. So light is two plus in the lattice, so when you add a charge, it becomes slightly less positive. So it's oxidation number reduces or so it gets reduced mm -hmm. by fractional amount. And so and the bonding in these are partially ionic, so there's less ionic strength to so the a little bit further. So that's how we rationalize structural characteristics. So we do see signatures of what we can attribute to polar formation, which is a good sign. So we're looking at the geometry, we look at optical spectra within the polaron well for both positive and negative polarons. And looking at, so we also screen for multiplicity of the polaron as well. So we have singlet, doublet, and triplets for both models. And so these represent the density of states. So blank space represents the whole occupation, whereas Shaded region uh, represents the, the added electron occupations, and I put a script for that spectra. And so we compute spectra for both these models. We essentially see the same trend as that the single and the doublets are generally brighter and have roughly the same transition energy compared to the doublets for both the positive and the negative polar. So, so that's the main takeaway we took behind, took away from out of the spectra is that singlets and triplets are generally brighter. So we focus more on those for the dynamics in the next section. And just as a methodological comparison, we chose one of the models and screened between functional choices because 
one of the things with polarons is that they're characterized by self-trapping the charge. So the known issues with the functional of PPE of the charge delocalizing too much. So just to check that we screen electronic structure and spectra for the negative singlet. And in our, so you can see that the density states are roughly the same. The peak positions are the same. There's a little bit of changing in the intensities. And we look at the spectra. So the green is the PVE functional. And the black is the HSC. We can see uh, similar characteristics that are just offset by energies. Whereas the HSC has a higher transition energy, which is what you would expect, because HSC generally underestimates, or PV underestimates gaps. So we see the same signatures, so the trends should be qualitatively the same. And so moving on to dynamics. And so for to describe dynamics, you have to be able, so non radiative dynamics, you have to be able to couple electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom. And so, how we implement that is we run uh, ab initio molecular dynamics for our models, and then we track the fluctuations of energy bands over time. And from these fluctuations, you can compute non adiabatic couplings. Along, along the trajectory, and then post processing of the couplings, we can get state to state transition rates for both for our models. And so, top row is specifically the negative polar on singlet, and then this row is the positive polar on singlet. And just looking at these, these red field tensors, which we described the rates of transition, the main features. Just comparing these two, as we can see that the negative polaron has lower intensity uh, rates compared to the positive, and there's less spreading along the diagonals. So that indicates that the positive polaron, there's more uh, non radiative transitions possible. So it should show quicker non radiative cooling compared to the negative polar on. And then when we run the dynamics for our system, we do see that. So this figure here is log time versus energy for our states. And so we just choose an initial condition and then run the dynamics based on the rates that we calculate. And we can see that the negative polar on does cool, or does have a longer hot carrier lifetime compared to the positive. So the positive cools roughly around picosecond or shorter than a picosecond, whereas the hot polaron shows about 10 picoseconds relaxation. And then screening just for uh, different initial conditions, we computed the rates and then plotted uh, energy dissipated versus block time for these transitions. And essentially what we see is that we compare the polar on cooling rates to, to models that we don't consider the polar on, so it's analogous to free charge. We see that the, the polar on models have a longer cool have a longer lifetime compared to the free carriers. So that indicates that there is polar on forming or signatures of polar on formation in our models from our methodology. Because you would expect that the polarons are generally described as screen going on interaction, so they should reduce uh, non radiative non transitions compared to free carriers. So that's a good sign from our cooling rates. So, so this describes non radiative relaxation of excited polaron states. And then along the same trajectories, we can compute radiative relaxations. So essentially, we're trying to characterize the photoluminescence capability of the polar polaron to see if it could be, to see how efficient it could potentially be at emitting fire. 
emitting uh, IR photons. So, so these plots, same log time, and then these give the energy of transitions along the trajectory. And then, so the colors just represent intensity. So once the carrier cools, it gives photoluminescence from the lowest energy transition. And then just from this plot, we can see that the negative polaron has about an order of magnitude more intensity for emitting photoluminescence during its trajectory. But to better characterize how efficient it is at emitting, we calculate a theoretical photoluminescence quantum yield from our radiative and non-radiative rates. So we take the non-radiative rate to be approximately the lowest energy recombination from our red field calculators. And then the radiative rate is from, we compute from Einstein coefficients for spontaneous emission. Then we just plug those into a simple quantum yield equation for rate of radiative over all the other recombination pathways for the system. And then when we compute the quantum yields for systems that we investigated, we see that generally that they're very low quantum yields. So the best, so the most efficient emitter is on an order of 10 to the negative fourth efficiency. So not very efficient. So that's like a 0.1, 0 0.01% quantum yield. But, so it's not very good at emission, but we did notice, notice an interesting feature that between all of the models that we investigated, that there was like a range of different photoluminescence quantum yields. And looking into the data where we see that for all the models, the radiative rates are roughly the same to differ by maybe half an order of magnitude, while as the non-radiative rates for our efficient emitter It'll show two orders of magnitude reduced uh, recombination rate. And so to try to be able to look in to see if there is a possible mechanism for why we observe this trend, we decided to try to hunt for resonances between radiative, between vibrational modes of the system and transition energies. From the system. So that's what we, this plot is describing here. So essentially, we're looking for frequencies of vibration from normal mode analysis and how it compares to uh, optical energy transitions from my IR spectra. And we see, and this is negative polaron, positive polaron. And we do see from aligning the axis seeds, there are appear to be some resonances between vibrational modes and the IR spectra. So we see for our most efficient emitter, which is the negative singlet, there appears to be in resonance with this ammonia peak, whereas the triplet is in resonance with the, the mode from the carboxylate ligand on the surface. And then the yeah, and then the positive polaron is in resonance with lower energy vibration from the lattice. And so the main distinction that I see is for our negative polaron. So there's a two order of magnitude difference between these two transitions. And the way I rationalize what the difference was is that for the carboxylates. They chemically bond to the system, so they have they provide active modes of vibration, which directly contribute to the non adiabatic couplings. Whereas for these NH bending modes from the ammonia, those are they don't provide electronic density to the surface. They're more of spectator modes, and so so it doesn't actually provide any vibrational pathways to release energy. So that this excited state has a longer lifetime due to a detuning from other vibrational modes. So yeah.
Yeah, that's how we explain the trend that we observe from our recombination rates. And so that wraps up the story of having individual polarons in the models. And the main takeaway <coughs> is we do see consistent signatures of polaron formation due to either bond elongations or coordinations occurring between halides. And the main takeaway is that it is possible that these polarons do have spectral features from transition to the eternal excited states. And they are pretty bright, but when you try to look for, to see if it could be possible photoluminescence, materials or potential IR emitters that they're generally quenched by higher energy vibrational modes from our from the surface ligands on these models. So it's just an instance of the surface providing it makes the system stable but it also helps reduce non-radiative transitions in the system. So the importance of surface chemistry on photophysics the polar arms and then so that's all one paper in itself that was published in JPCC JPCC earlier this year and then we're moving on to a system that we're mostly interested in is the simultaneous positive negative polar arms in these models and so just to give an idea of why Simultaneous would be different just compared to having an individual charge. If you look at the same plot that I described earlier about the charge density in the in the model. So previously it's just the whole charge evenly distributed throughout the whole crystal. Whereas if you put both the charges in at the same time, it's like you have positive and negative, so it's like what charge is gonna win out in the model? And then just plotting charge density, putting in a hole and an electron. So the hole is the yellow color, the yellow density, whereas the electron density is the blue. So we've seen this model that when we introduce simultaneous charges in that, it's kind of like shells of charge. So at the very interior, it's negative. And so the next layer out, it's kind of a positive charge. And then it's another shell of negative charge. So you should see quantitative differences in nuclear organization and excited state dynamics as well. And so just for this model, so looking at radio distribution functions again. Really, so it's the same A and B peaks that I described above. Whereas before, we just had one of the charges in the box, we would only see one of the peaks move significantly, whereas if we put both charges in, we see a reorganization of both A and the B peak. So I guess you would kind of expect that too, because they provide equal contribution. Like you see one only changes A, one only changes B. So if you put in both, we see changes. But the interesting thing for simultaneous is that if you just put in a negative charge, the bond would elongate. Whereas for this model, when we put in when we put in both positive and negative, there's bond contraction. So it does show a difference in the bonding of the system. We have both charges. And so and for electronic structures again we screen for different spin multiplicities. So singlet and triplet. And in these density of states figures, the hole is represented by this white space in the density states, whereas the negative is represented by the, the filled red area in these curves. So for the whole polarons, for single and triple, the density states looks qualitatively the same. There's not a lot of changes in the peak positions. Whereas if you look at the triplet, though, there is kind of a broadening of the density of states here in the conduction band. And so you know, we do see the signature of this broadening show up in the IR spectra for this model. So, 
So computing by our spec for the model, we see that the positive, so the black solid lines, those are roughly show the same characteristics in terms of energy and where the peaks are located. Whereas with the negative polar on, you see that the lowest transition energy is zero EV. Whereas for the triplet, we see a bright signature at a higher energy for the same model. So the way that I kind of think about that is for the triplets, it introduces another interaction uh, that can split the energy band to provide the broadening. So it's like, well, triplets are magnetic, so it's a magnetic force, which kind of rearranges the density of states and kind of, it opens it up a little bit. So that's how I characterize or understand these transitions. Now you can also look at cross the band gap transitions, which I don't have plotted here. I haven't looked at characterized human intensity yet. Further work, our further goals for this work is to try to see if we can characterize the influence of polar on degrees of freedom on the radiative recombination in these materials, because it is kind of counterintuitive that if you have two polar ons, you wouldn't expect them to be bright emitters because they're supposed to, they provide a barrier to recombination. So these materials, they do show experimentally efficient emission. So it is kind of counterintuitive. So it is a good, so it is a fun little system to try to characterize and figure out. And yeah, that's the presentation. Okay, that thing, or any suggestions? Uh, any critical points, or if, if you want just to glorify and say how nice it is, you can skip. There are some questions, please. So, I guess the first question is what's the meaning of the plot? What's the meaning of the plot? So, so large is defined, so you can have two different limits. So, you can have a small polar up or it's a charge trapped on a single atomic site, like a transition metal, for instance, where the large polaron is just, it's more delocalized <coughs> over multiple unit cells. So it can have like, it can have a variable like, spatial size, depending on the type of material. Mm -hmm. By size, it's like order 10 nanometers. Also, I guess we use SPE notation. Mm -hmm. It's just from the angular function of the output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, analogous to like atomic transitions or symmetry of the envelope function. And the, the IR condition. Did you try to compute the IR condition of the neutron model? In use? Yes. I'm wondering if there is any intropath in our mission on this one. Uh, it's so strong. I hear what you're saying. I think, I mean, it would be weak compared to everything. That's because. So it is possible to have IR emission with the hot electron from the neutral model. But I don't remember those. They didn't have a lot of intensity, or they were a lot less intense than the main photoluminescence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I guess these, I guess not well shown with this figure, but these, like the energies of transitions do correspond to these transitions. More questions or suggestions? If no, let's thank uh, Aaron once again. And uh, Aaron, please collect uh, feedback.
I have some, uh, and if, if you are writing just with assembly, so that you can submit it to the other side. My suggestion is that it's more for the hours, because your um, two dimensional telephone hole portals seem to be a different color for here and there. Mm -hmm. Like your electron is blue and hole is here and here. Otherwise, I don't care, but some visitors can mm -hmm. uh, Also, it's cosmetics. If you label a singlet with uh, bright green filling, you know, you use the same. Uh, Uh, David, would you like to share something about your book? at in this project is the photo um, is the photo optical properties of two-dimensional perovskites and when I describe two-dimensional perovskite what we're looking at is perovskite layer that's been separated by some spacer molecule or atom causing the perovskite to form a sheath instead of a bulk three-dimensional model and I'm looking at two different types of spacers and spacers here one of them is a organic spacer ligand and the other is a inorganic ion So the reason that these are being looked at is the perovskites have good properties for photovoltaics, but the bulk perovskite materials are uh, degrade easily to environmental factors. where the, we see that the, these two-dimensional materials have, have a greater stability compared to their two-dimensional models. I'm not sure what to, to, how to logically arrange the main outcome of your calculations are rates of uh, relaxation like, rates. Relaxation rates. And you may uh, arrange everything you talk about targeted to this. Like, uh, pretend that your goal is to to relaxation rates, even if it is not. Pretend that uh, the main achievement that will save the world is to come to relaxation rates. Like, try to connect it and then arrange methods and everything in this direction. So, what I'm trying to determine with these calculations is the relaxation rates because a 
longer relaxation rate allows for a greater chance for the charges to separate, which is essential for photovoltaic uh, processes. So which methods are needed um, to procure this goal? So to determine the relaxation rate, the rates we want to use the, the final equation that I have listed here, the one that I apparently didn't make big. No, no, this size is, 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 is perfect uh, visitor as opposed to we'll see. Um, um, would you like to briefly guide us with equation? So, my methods I have looking at the so at, at, as we look at the the results we see that the density of states is um, determined by factoring in the occupation. Can you continue this? Yeah. Uh, there's, I do not want to doubt that you can explain each equation, but uh, uh, what if the logic? It's not like the exam show, look at me how many equations I need. <laughs> Um, your goal is to get relaxation rates. Yes. And the equation for relaxation rate is missing. It should be uh, the last one after your equation for expectation value of energy. And uh, we are doing this collective editing and uh, collective presentations uh, with the purpose that we can borrow ideas, maybe not literally copy paste, but just uh, borrow the ideas of these equations. And or try to navigate, uh, find an equation for relaxation rate in other posters and copy it to your to your poster. Uh, a little suggestion if you and, and if anyone is writing feedback, you may um, focus on the if you agree. The methods could be hard for a single human to navigate through at once. And they can be divide, uh, divided and cut. So uh, there are uh, at least three categories. So one can split equations in, in three pieces. First, and, and, and uh, if you are listening, looking at what Aaron was doing, it, it's quite standard. First, static problems. Okay. Second, dynamic processes, and third, observables. Like you, observables is basically your, your rates, but uh, it's your free choice to make this categorization something different, but chopping it on categories will, will help uh, logical jump from equation to equation. Please keep going. Yeah. 
we're welcome to see how our video if you are not sure which slot is the best, share the most. What are we doing here? Why is it the time to get first? A deep so oh. nice red field figure in the middle of column and no one focus on it. He should probably bring everyone's attention. What are the rates of relaxation on your green figure? Can you visually show it? So we have some rates, low hearts. Okay, and um, you give quite precise numbers with uh, two significant figures. Yes. How do you get them? Yeah. You don't tell the code gives them. Tell them how, how they compute it. It's um, based on the average uh, energy at a specific time. So, uh, is there a fitting procedure involved? Uh, yes. So, fitting to each function? Uh. And feel free to ask. Audience. No, 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 which mathematical function? Oh. So your energy of uh, electron decreases with time? Yes. How quick? According to which word? Does it decrease as uh, minus t linear? Or one over T. If I remember, it's one over T, but I'm not. Oh, one over T is a good approximation, and, and uh, most typically is assumed that it is uh, decreases exponential. So what, what you are doing, you are fitting this uh, dashed line to exponential function, and find, you know, finding the way. Yep. Okay. What okay. are the conclusions? We see that the, as, as expected, the larger layers of crosskite have a smaller band gap compared to the, to the mm -hmm. smaller layers of crosskite. We also see that the fully inorganic model has a faster relaxation rate than the hybrid models. Okay, well, uh, thank you, David. And any uh, suggestions to express the verbal? <coughs> any questions or, or thoughts? What, uh, what is recommended to focus? 
under the test. Is your inorganic layer or inorganic system that n equals four? Uh, yes. So I mean, you don't know what to talk about. That would be an, an easy comparison. Like just to point out differences in their spectra and density of states. And then all the other observables as well. But and yeah, I noticed the problem with my couplings yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I'm fixing them now. Have the figures for that. Very good. Very good. More suggestions? If not now, then uh, let's thank David once again. And David, uh, please, please uh, collect uh, the feedback and try your best to read it. Thank you. Thank So basically, in this mod, in this study, we focus on our server cell and also for our outside, and also a cation cluster and organic cluster. So the cation cluster is electron transport material. The phi is a cold transport material. So basically, we apply electrical field normal to the surface of the phosphide. And then we study the uh, induced electronic structure of our models. We then character characterize the uh, uh, charge carrier dynamics of this system under different electric fields. So basically, so for our semiconductors, we shine light. So there will be hot electrons and hot holes. And uh, this hot electron, hot holes will just relax to the bond state. So that is vibrations to so basically just character, characterize these processes. So this is a DFT study for the bond state structures. We do our calculations in RASP using the function. This is still restricted DFT. And then for the uh, character dynamics, we have a home made. Swiss, so they are configurations. So here you find the type of structures. This is 45 megawatts bandstrom for system. From top to the bottom, the electron field just equals. And we can see uh, from top to the bottom, the band gap increase from from two electron to the bottom. Uh, this is the relationship between the band gap and the electric field. Basically, we have a linear relationship. Mm -hmm. So, can you please verbalize uh, this positive electric field? How does bottom of the Titanium dioxide band changes. Okay, so just as the pedals, pedals have three components phosphide, titanium, and uh, organic dye. So if we change the natural field, so basically the band of the phosphide stays the same, uh -huh. but the band of the titanium just shifts to the right. Which means increases right. with positive electric field. It moves up. So it's negative electric field, it moves up. Right. And the, the organic dye does shift to the other direction. And um, 
would be, I apologize for asking silly, silly questions, mm -hmm. but uh, now, how does the maximum of the valence band or homo of the dye behaves with the same negative field? Homo, how does energy of the homo of the dye changes if electric field is negative? Shift to the left, so it decreases. Yes. So is electric field goes from positive to negative, the conductivity decreases. And if uh, we go for, uh, if, if, if it goes from negative to positive, conductivity increases by several order magnitude. Right. So change of electric field from negative to positive increases conductivity. Are they, are they for zero? Uh, apologies for interrupting. Are they for zero field or for certain field? <coughs> So optical uh, excitation promotes most probable uh, transitions from home minus seven to lumen plus seven. Yes. And what's the frequency for volts in, in nanometers it's like four, 400 or more precise huh? and which color it is the blue Before we go further, can we look at the uh, equations? 
and I, I do not know the, the answer. It's not like uh, testing. I mean, constructively trying to find if we do not have any software and we want to write it from scratch, how would we add the electric field into this Poincham equation? I think it's just like the spin of the cup and you just add an equation. Can we just put inside these brackets after, yes, like uh, minus dipole operator times uh, electric field? And then, even if it is not what we personally are doing, it will bring a little certainty. Yes. Okay. And then um, um, one can add additional rubric into the equations uh, and place uh, the called perturbation theory and tell that uh, energy of orbital i uh, under field is approximately equal to energy of the same orbital load field minus uh, matrix mm -hmm. element times electric field. OK, yeah. It, it will, just knowing the audience, it will help them a lot to understand what is, what is being done. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. And I, I made this. Is it, is, it, is it possible to uh, summarize this table in a graph as well? Like with x axis as electric field? <laughs> and y as a, as a, as a rate? Mm -hmm. And have different symbols or different colors for, for different uh, uh, transitions? Another reason why I was not confused became a little bit strange to this. Compared to the top three, the band of R type also shifts a little bit. So, for example, here we have the P book. band of R type almost kept the same, but right here it's just shift to the right a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, but thank you. So, any questions or comments or suggestions? And questions can be not necessarily for improving poster, but something was not clear. And uh, we want to implement the same uh, approach to you.
uh, if I know nothing about the approach posted for the first time, I'm missing very much a schematic layer. Uh, some, some abstract. You know? For example, it could be It's too simple, we do not need it to show that. So, uh, conduction then for the Curves created again the side and right, and then uh, one can also show that this problem it moves, it creates uh, excitation, and then uh, everything goes one side, <coughs> or goes other side, and then uh, the Things that uh, we were discussing how much the when edges are affected by uh, by fuel with conduction benefit and oxide increases as benefit uh, by decreases and is major because it is expected that it is a major factor. Mm -hmm. More questions and suggestions. What do you say the difference was when you put in a negative much fuel here to the positive? In terms of density of states? So I guess one changes like how the ladder is up here, dealing with the position. The second is the fan of Osprey also shift compared to the other thing that we did. And then remember, I guess last time, Petria had five data points. The fifth data point is at minus one three meters times one. And we can clearly see very good. Ship and structures in the prospect, mm -hmm. which also makes the fifth data point at the other time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Because it would be. Uh, that's not usually occupied by a halide. So you have some halide. So the abromium is like P or P or? I guess it's I'm just trying to think why a negative field would have fit. Whereas positive doesn't. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's some feature like positive. Field pushes it deeper into the balance band where the negative field draws it out into the like band gap area. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't have a direct question. I was just Clarifying. Yeah, I guess maybe I can just double check on the other place. We'll take the place we can do from the bottom of the password and lock it. Yeah. 
more questions or suggestions? If no, I thank you once again. If it's my four four zeros. Graphing has um, an extra um, um, I'm going to make this part. <coughs> yeah, so each graph atom has the three nearest neighbor uh, carbon atoms. Each carbon atom has three nearest neighbor carbon atoms, and uh, uh, other net nearest neighbor uh, atoms. Mm -hmm. And this is the um, advancing metallium of the graphene. This first one for uh, nearest neighbor carbon atoms, and this second one for our next nearest neighbor carbon atoms. If we consider only ne uh, nearest neighbor carbon atoms and solve it, we can get this multi dispersion relation. And here we have precise positive and negative positive for conduction band, uh, for electron, and negative for pole. Um, mm, in the Here, these two equations are uh, for the uh, eigenfunction of this endothelium. Mm. Right. Here, obviously, in two dimensions, and uh, the momentum k is function of k, x, and k, y. The equation for uh, two dimensional work ticket is here. Um, I <laughs> Edit this first line uh, yeah. So there should be one more term that's a function of y. Um, and if we uh, calculate the Fourier terms, the transform of this uh, this position, um, uh, work on again function in position space, we get the uh, um, again function in momentum space. Yeah. Can, you, can you intervene and sure. it's not a it's not again function is initial. Initial condition for solving time dependence of equation. Initial conditions. Yes. And uh, let me suggest some changes right away. Mm -hmm. you can uh, accept it with the claim.
we, we do accept it. <coughs> so uh, the logic is after doing reporting the three little things that can be taken from the future, up here, one uses uh, this information to form a way that we can then one introduces the magnetic field and solves first time independent training equation, then time dependent training equation. Before solving time dependent training equation, one needs to form a way to initial condition. But uh, please uh, think if you accept it and uh, uh, describe I it. I have a question how they are initial condition. Yes. They are work function. The word eigen should be removed. This uh, Gaussian wave function cannot be uh, an eigenstate. It's guaranteed that it will not be an eigenstate. Initial conditions mean the work functions and the initial point? The initial time step. I know, please explain it by your own words, if, if you accept this logic. And then in the abs uh, absence of external magnetic field, uh, the metronym is here. Uh, this is for, for uh, And in the presence of magnetic field, uh, there is another term uh, here. Now, uh, when the magnetic field is in three, uh, applied, then the corresponding Schrodinger equation here, this one. And since we are considering uh, z directionally, we can consider this angle uh, uh, in, in, in the z direction. And this equation is a time dependent uh, Schrodinger equation, and we can take the time relation need to operate on this time dependent Schrodinger equation. And then these are the initial conditions. Right? Good. Good. Okay. Uh, here I calculated um, these are the magnetic uh, uh, electron dynamics when the magnetic field is applied to the ducting. Uh, these three figures in three different time steps. This one for 0.12 femtoseconds, 12 femtoseconds, and 24 femtoseconds. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the value of magnetic field is here, uh, 0.7 Tesla. And this one for a little uh, higher uh, applied magnetic field, 1.92 Tesla, and the time steps are the same uh, time steps. So here, in the uh, when magnetic field, uh, middle of magnetic field is lower, you can see really not much different dynamics. It uh, starts here a little bit and then a uh, uh, little higher here. But if the magnetic field, the middle of magnetic field is higher, you can see. And these will, uh, these are the corresponding. Mm -hmm. yep. Can you please explain why the figures are hexagonal? Uh, because this is the, we consider this building zone here. So that's why they are. And each corner here it, uh, represents, each corner represents by this red uh, uh, dot. They are the digit points. What happens if wave packet bumps into the wall of this hexagon? Not in calculations, but in, in nature. It will go to the next one because it just shows the one um, brilliant zone. And they are, it's continuous in two dimensions. Okay. Oh, would, it, would it just uh, go into the next band? Like wall plus one? Um, I'm because if, okay. when, we, when we draw band structure mm -hmm. in one dimension, mm -hmm. we never get bigger than uh, 5 over 8. It's maximal wave length. Mm -hmm. 
And if you continue to approach the edge, if you need to, to go higher, the band just flips. Um, actually, I'm not sure about if the magnetic field is applied, then electron is excited or not. Uh, because the, when magnetic field is applied, electron gets motion, but I'm not sure if it is like the higher states. Okay. But if you shine light on it, it, it even if it will, but the magnetic field, I'm not sure. Okay. Since it moves in two dimensions, cyclic mm -hmm. motion. Okay. And uh, you are going to explain the top panel with eigenstates? Yeah. And be before you, you go there, I will just pose which question I, I would like to ask, <coughs> which I'm already writing. Okay. Uh, would it be reasonable and would it be possible to present eigenstates in the same format as we present dynamics, to enclose it into the hexagonals? Mm. Uh, yeah, I can do that, but um, but I have concern here because uh, this is for uh, magnetic is equal seven Tesla. Here we can see that uh, uh, the electron dynamics not much spread here, spreading. But here uh, we can see the eigenstates. Um, What's wrong? Why does it go? If you if you look for dynamics for longer time, it will spread further and further. Okay. But here time. There is no time. time for yeah. eigenstate. There is no time. Uh, so for this magnetic field, it will spread like further. I I don't think it can come here. If you is it possible? I don't. If think you so. wait long enough, if you uh, increase time step or use more steps, there is a high chance that you will go there. The uh, twenty-four femtoseconds is very short time. Mm -hmm. Ah yes, very short term, but we need short term. We are not. Uh, uh, interested in the bigger time scale. Why? Because in all, whatever you think, like optoelectronic or photovoltaics or quantum information, they are very quick, like 10 to second or picosecond time scale. It's but not like. Why? Electron motion is the very fast. But it, it's not like. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, Aaron may, may answer it. Maybe we were discussing it. It, it relates with your very new projects and, and your very new abstract. So, why is there, it is uh, it makes sense to explore electron dynamics only on short times? Why, uh, on the long time, it is not as interesting? What happens? Why we are using here? Schrodinger equation instead of um, uh, Louisville, instead of Redfield uh, dynamics. I understand that uh, just because we do not have the codes are not updated, but what is the motivation and justification? In which case uh, Schrodinger equation is applicable? Because here there is perturbation, magnetic field. Um, where is relaxation due to phonons? What is that? Where is mm -hmm. relaxation due to phonons, due to interaction with uh, lattice vibrations? I don't understand the question. Where why, is... why these equations do not include interaction mm -hmm. between electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom? Why there is no Redfield tensor? Why is there is no relaxation? Is it justified? Yes. Why? Because it's magnetic field, mm -mm. not like um, mm -mm. so. If there is no heat here, there is no applied heat. There is the system as a like model is not heating. But there is. Um, it means that you are um, approximated to zero temperature, zero K, right? Zero K at room temperature. No, no, at room temperature. 
the reason to reaction with lattice vibrations. And uh, in um, any experiment, relaxation does happen, does occur. Uh, one is focusing on a very short time. The justification is that um, we can neglect relaxation if you look on such short times that they are shorter than relaxation. So nothing will relax yet. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not uh, arguing and adding argument to support your, your idea. So uh, one is looking on uh, short times because uh, we want to explore the regime where the relaxation didn't happen yet. Okay, so what about eigenstates? Yeah, and uh, for this one, even uh, even this uh, looks like the different dynamics is not uh, it it won't find in this region, but uh, here are the states that are spreading over, over the uh, free angle. Let, let's um, do let's separate this discussion into two categories. What you mm -hmm. You're trying to do two things at once, and I'm suggesting to split these two things. So, um, first thing is to just present and describe how eigenstates look like, and second thing, to establish correlation between features of eigenstates and features of electron dynamics. Mm -hmm. Let's postpone analysis of this connection between eigenstates and dynamics for next 10 minutes and focus only on eigenstates. So can you just briefly tell what they are and what are their features? So these um, these are the electronic states. Mm -hmm. This is the gas J P fifty one, and energy is C of I or the P. I'm not sure. Here's the uh, eigenstates which has been pretty packed. It's a superposition of several eigenstates to compose the pretty packet. Right? How many eigenstates do we have? I've got the question. I have the answer. I need a few seconds to, to pr prepare. Can I? Yeah. Answer the question. Uh, we'll quickly write and then uh, come.
both visible boxes. Okay, so there are two ways to propagate the function in time. So uh, suppose that our goal is to start this wave function at time zero and obtain wave function at time bigger than zero. So uh, one way is to apply evolution operator that includes Hamiltonian explicit. And in this case, we do not care about eigenstates at all. This is very universal but very numerically expensive. Your question relates to more uh, inexpensive way, which we, we do not apply here. So this uh, uh, results by Fatima are, are done with uh, time evolution, which is applicable even if one cannot find eigenstates or if they have no sense. Like if, there is, uh, if it is like plain waves, and, uh, strange things are known. More traditional instead, and these all solutions mean solving time differential equations. Yes, all things are a uh, solution of time differential equations. And the uh, more canonical traditional way is to first solve time independent, find a set of eigenstates and then construct time-dependent solution as a superposition of uh, eigenstates, each of which evolves in time according to its uh, eigenenergy. And uh, the, this solution enters in the partial solution, enters into the general solution, enters into the partial with weight coefficients. And these weight coefficients are obtained by uh, overlap between uh, initial state, time equals zero, and certain eigen, eigen state. So, uh, if we would implement, if you first use eigen functions, eigen states that Fatima has already found, and then solve it in, 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 uh, according to this equation, the, the code which currently runs for an hour. This would run within like one second. Your question about number, of, uh, in which range this i changes. Number um, of the eigenstates is equivalent to number of grid points. So it's two dimensional grid, about 60 by 60, 50 by 50, so about 250, 2,400, 3,000 uh, grid points number of eigenstates is the same. But in order to construct legitimate solutions uh, that you described uh, physics and we seem to get, it is more than enough to use like first 300 eigenstates. The uh, eigenstates with higher energy can be thrown outside in a similar way as um, designers of bus are doing. They are setting, setting up the n hat parameter and uh, do not consider plane waves which give energy more than uh, 500 times both, but they definitely will not compute it in physics. Does that answer your question? So then are you looking for features in the time evolution? Or similar features between eigenstates and the time evolution. Are trying to hope to see that some characteristics appear. Yeah, I guess time evolution of all um, electron waves is it from one key point to another. Yeah. But, but it, it's not all. With, with, with the, uh, I guess the question is like whether you can get to the same point using the two different methods? Or ideally, oh. that's what you'd like? There is no doubt that uh, both methods can give the same result. The idea to find eigenstates came much later than originally. It's 
этих additional clusters, не крупнится. Uh, we have more about Karen's question about connection between eigenstates and dynamics. Even I'm not clear. <laughs> okay, what, 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 what we add? Uh, <coughs> I, I have a question, I guess. Okay, so after looking at your data, I thought you have very clear verbal explanations with it because you place the data in a very logical way. So here are sets of sample eigenstates. So although there is like 3,000, and we is interesting to use in the first 300 of the year. That even shows representing that plus than one, two, three, two, three. And the same numbers are explored at different values of omega Q. Okay. And the, the energies of this uh, state with the same index are not drastically different, they're in the same range. But the shape of the wave functions is, is different. This larger value of omega Q the eigenstates become more developed. So here it is approximately two peaks. Here it comes with a ring with certain peaks with maximum and certain peaks. Which means the eigenstate corresponds to geocalized wave function. And localization here is not in, in position space, it is in momentum space. So this circle means that uh, if we are in this eigenstate with this energy, that there are several values of momentum which are allowed simultaneously. Probably in the Cartesian space, this ring will correspond, uh, this uh, state will correspond to the packet rapidly moving in all directions. Mm -hmm. While here, this fix means it, uh, it moves only in two directions. So this is a fix and then uh, Certain value of momentum means uh, it is a plane wave index mm -hmm. to the power i in index. And in that case, it could be plus or minus. Yes, but in that case, it looks. Uh, for the, uh, like if this is x, then for x, it goes one part of the wave packet goes positive, another negative, and for y, both of them are going in the same direction. If one would use magnetic field equals zero, all eigenstates will be represented only by single delta function. Plane wave will be uh, eigenstate uh, of this field. Mm -hmm. So as far as one, and this trend maintains, larger field, more delocalized eigenstate. If one assumes uh, that uh, this trend, so this was part one, but now this of eigenstate. Now, if one tries to establish a connection between features of eigenstates and features of dynamics, and it is really great that I don't know, place these same values, so it's a uh, logical connection. So, <coughs> for um, basis, this more delocalization it is expected that departure from initial of, uh, localized personal effect will happen quicker on, on a further distance. So it brings on a smaller distance and goes further. Here it looks like brings on a couple of sub peaks and goes not too far. Here there are more small peaks and they are more they go to further distance. If it will be classical unit not from the mechanics, but just classical part of it. Then in magnetic field, the uh, initial moment of the photon will take you to go into the circular form. Since it is quantized uh, feature, the, um, the eigenstates do not, uh, in this case, this, they do not prefer one or another direction. It's more like they tend to form the cir circular patterns. Therefore, Instead of going one preferred direction, prompted by a very much it distributes almost equally in both directions. And it is a um, major surprise by comparing this uh, results with intuitive expectations based on the uh, process. So, so, why? Any physical meaning 
I was laboring in the space, like the space behind the station one. Because previous weeks, I maybe we just uh, was sleeping there at the state matters. So the state one is the most important one. To be the most bound. Oh, I guess the bank also. I would assume like state one. We have time for, oh yes, we have a little time. Let me bring up uh, all eigenstates. And whoever of us, uh, uh, I don't know if Kevin, but if you guys are me or Aaron showing this poster. So uh, probably you know, based your foot, the iPad is moving in your body. One thing is not clear to me, that if magnetic field is applied electron uh, is going to higher state, if electron doesn't go to higher state, why do you care about this uh, 351 state higher uh, state? Yuan, can you address this question? Mm -hmm. oh, please discuss with Yuan this question and I will try to bring up a movie. I just need a couple of seconds, but uh, ask him once again. He should be. Able to just repeat the question. So do you have uh, the answer why if we apply magnetic field and uh, if electron is not going to higher state, why do you apply light on? So when I apply uh, magnetic field is applied, does electron go to excited states? I know if we light we have apply light. Then it goes, it can go as But in magnetic field. It's really not the same Sorry for the motion. It's uh, on the ground state. That, that's the my com that's my computation. Like electron is going to higher state or it's on ground state of moving. If you are if the if electron is in ground state, it cannot move. It's, it's uh, the equations that I, I was showing you have them. The motion is constructive and destructive interference of multiple eigenstates. And in, uh, in order to represent motion in the, the, in the best way, one would need to include as much as possible phase states. Uh, if one truncate basis to lower energies, the precision will suffer. So taking more and more, and uh, all eigenstates will increase precision. And uh, here are uh, the eigenstates. If you, it's, it's maybe not best presentation, but you see in the lower part, there is an index of state, and in the upper part, there is an uh, energy. So when the index of state is close to uh, one, they are more localized in, uh, in the uh, k, k prime point, in the Dirac points, right? But as um, far as uh, energy increases, they uh, start to be constructed of all Dirac points uh, contributing simultaneously, and instead of points or little spots, they take shapes which look more like a circle or rectangular or some uh, closed uh, trajectory. And this eigenstates that represent closed trajectory would contribute to circular motion or um, motion along, along trajectories. Yes, If not, I thank her once again. And uh, now the floor is uh, given to Kevin. I'm pulling up my notes on my cell phone.
Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, all right, so uh, before I get into the meal of the talk, uh, I just want to quickly like uh, introduce non-adiabatic dynamics and uh, specifically doping. So first, uh, non-adiabatic dynamics. In the, in the regular uh, adiabatic uh, approach, when an electron is transitioning between orbitals, uh, the nucleus is assumed to be uh, still and, and not moving. So if we look at this e equation uh, right uh, right here, uh, the expectation va values are going to be zero because the orbitals aren't changing with time. However, in the non-adiabatic uh, approach, the nucleus is uh, moving or is it is vibrating. So therefore, the, the orbitals are are going to shift. So therefore, the the transition rates and expectation values uh, when an electron is moving between or orbitals is going to be uh, non-zero. Non so that's the non-adiabatic approach in, uh, in two minutes. Um, so next thing, uh, I looked at lead uh, to telluride uh, nan nanowire, specifically the charge transfer weights. Uh, and, and to do that, I looked at uh, doped lead telluride uh, nanowires. Um, if, we, if the lead telluride nanowires weren't doping, uh, weren't doped, they would have uh, ne negligible charge transfer rates. So by doping these uh, lead telluride na nanowires, the charge transfer rate is significantly increased. Uh, now, if you remember from the, the periodic uh, table, uh, lead has uh, two, two valence electrons, and, and telluride needs uh, two, two electrons to fill its uh, outer shell. So lead that gives it uh, two extra electrons to the telluride. So uh, when we dope these uh, lead telluride nanowires, uh, I, I looked at lead telluride nanowires doped with the uh, sodium and iodine. Uh, the, the sodium uh, atom is going to replace the, the lead atoms because sodium is giving off a one electron. It has one extra electron in its uh, valence shell. And then it's also doped with, with iodine because iodine just needs a one electron to fill its uh, its uh, outer shell. All right. So sodium replaces uh, lead, and uh, iodine uh, re uh, replaces telluride. And by uh, do doping these lead telluride nanowires, uh, the charge transfer uh, rates is uh, significantly uh, increased. All right. All right, any questions uh, about that, what I just talked about? OK, so uh, well, what, I, what I did for, uh, for this was I, st I studied uh, lead, lead telluride uh, nanowires uh, using uh, non-adiabatic dynamics. So what I did first was uh, using uh, VOS so software, uh, I used uh, density uh, functional theory uh, to, to find the energy and uh, position eigenvalues. So if you look at my method section uh, here, this is the equation I used in VOS density for functional uh, theory. All right. And then uh, after I used the VOS output, I fed them into uh, so, some code I have in MATLAB uh, to calculate uh, my non adiabatic dynamics. Specifically, I used them to find out how my uh, energy eigenvalues and position eigenvalues uh, change changed with time. Word eigen, I, sure. Word eigenvalues uh, is not applicable here. We will okay. remove them from, from the text. And uh, I, I will mark it here. When you are going in your density matrix dynamics uh, category, Mm -hmm. When you go from the non adiabatic couplings to equation of motion for rho to density matrix, you are showing some uh, 
Um, can you just point it by laser or by finger? This one? Next time. Uh, minus uh, commutator with rho, and the next term here. So it is s comma lambda uh, rho. So this s and lambda mm -hmm. likely depend on your non adiabatic couple. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Because it's uh, how the lattice vibrations affect alternate degrees of freedom. All right. But are there any additional details in uh, equations? How the symbol V for non adiabatic couplings enters into your into into this S and lambda into your equation of motion for electronic degrees of freedom. If you don't have answer right now, let postpone it. Uh, feel free to look through posters of others and try to borrow ideas from there. But it is uh, a question that uh, a visitor will ask you. Okay. okay just keep going. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, all right, so then I, I used uh, va wasp output, and I, I performed uh, non adiabatic calculations using my, my MATLAB software. Uh, specifically, these are, are the calculations I, I used. Uh, then this one, uh, where we're finding out how my expectation values are uh, changing uh, with, with time. And, and also this equation right here, we're, we're also finding out how the p positions of my nuclei are uh, changing uh, with, with time because in the non-adiabatic approach, we're assuming that the nucleus uh, uh, vibrates. All right. So so then uh, using non-adiabatic that dynamics, uh, uh, I found out how my uh, and how my energy eigenvalues uh, changed with time, and I found out how no sorry I shouldn't use eigenvalues. So I found out how my energy changed with time, and I found out how my uh, per position uh, change with, with time. All right. Uh, okay. So so let's first look at the these graphs. My uh, per position versus time. Uh, I looked at uh, four different uh, orbital transitions at uh, di different temperatures. Uh, so uh, you'll you'll see as the temperature increases. For example, I'm looking at the HOMO to LUMO plus 7 transition, you'll find that as my temperature uh, A increases, the, the charge transfer uh, B increases. Uh, see that, see this, this gets wider and wider as the temperature increases, all right? And uh, another thing to, to notice, if you look at my, my model here, the charge uh, transfer is uh, localized to my uh, IOD doping, so it's localized to uh, this region right here, uh, you'll you'll see that on uh, all all my graphs. So, uh, in summary, two two things to know: a uh, charge transfer rate is uh, localized in the IOD region, and then uh, my uh, and then as my uh, temperature in increases, the charge transfer uh, rates increase. All right. So those those are the two main uh, uh, thing conclusions I drew. Uh, from my uh, data here. Um, okay, and then uh, my uh, and and then these are my uh, energy versus time graphs. I specifically looked at how energy uh, changed uh, with, with time for uh, different orbital uh, transitions at uh, different temperatures. Um, so uh, so I calculated uh, my. My relaxation rates for, for my electron and, and hole. So basically, uh, the relaxation rates for, for my electron, think of them as uh, the, the derivatives of uh, the, these lines here for my energy versus time graphs. My dashed line here uh, is uh, is the, the electron, and my uh, solid line is, a, is the hole here. So these graphs are specifically how the, the energy of the electron and hole uh, changes with time. All right. So, so I use non-adiabatic dynamics and MATLAB uh, to to find this out and to to calculate the re relaxation rates. Uh, and then I I used uh, these graphs here to see how my uh, how my relaxation rates uh, for my electron and my electron hole uh, changed uh, with energy. 
So uh, if you look at the, these bottom two uh, temperatures uh, right here, you'll see that they, are, they almost have a, a flat slope, all right? So it seems that, uh, that the change for these lower temperatures is almost uh, negligible. But however, as we uh, get to these uh, uh, higher temperatures, uh, the, you'll see uh, an increase, or I should say a decrease in the slope here. Uh, all right. So then a conclusion uh, I drew for, from this is uh, the, the band gap law, which is uh, the, this equation right here, the elect electronic relaxation rates is equal to E to the negative alpha delta E, which is the, the change in, in energy. The band gap law is apply, applies for Wizard. electrons uh, at high, high temperatures, all right? But uh, not not for for the electron hole because as you can see here at, on this graph, uh, the the slopes are, are almost zero. All right, so that that's the conclusion I, I drew from this. And then the the next thing um, I want want to talk about are the these graphs uh, right here. I looked at how the electronic relaxation rates um, in, increased uh, with with temperature, um, so so when I look at these graphs, uh, I I essentially uh, concluded that the rate, rate of change with respect to temperature for each orbital transition is essentially constant. It, it's the same because for both of these graphs, uh, the graphs for uh, different orbital transitions overlap. So therefore, the rate of change with respect to temperature must be the same. No matter what orbital transition uh, you're you're looking at, so um, I I conclude that um, I'll, that this alpha thing right uh, right here, which you see in the band gap law on my my abstract, um, is is the same no matter what orbital transition you're you're looking at, and alpha is uh, one over kBT kB. KB is the Boltzmann constant, and then T um, is is the temperature. Let's see. A, B, A, C, A, B. And then um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Any questions? Oh yes. Anyone wants to ask any question? How does your observables equations relate to the figure, to one of your figures? Um, oh, you mean this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so this is the electron relaxation rate of the electron. Uh, so, so this is just the derivative of this uh, dashed line right here. You see all these uh, the dashed lines. Um, that's the, the expectation value for, for the electron. Uh, so, so this is just the derivative of uh, all these uh, dashed lines here. And then this relaxation rate for, for the whole, that's the derivative of this solid line here, which is uh, how the expectation value of the electron hole uh, changes with time. So this is the derivative of this graph, essentially. Does that make sense? The explanation makes sense. All right. I guess the notation might be like the oh, um, equation might be. These also. are just typos. I don't know how I see the know. typos, but I mean. So you, so we assume single exponential rate, or oh, yeah. like when we skip the curves. So I guess where does the exponential show up? Your observable equation. Um, well, well, you don't you don't see uh, an exponential here because I'm taking the, the natural law of of this uh, re relaxation rate. So, so when I fit, fit this, I would naturally expect it to to fit with a straight line. So that's why you don't see an exponent exponential here because this isn't the relaxation rate. This is the natural law of that relaxation rate. Right, I guess, like the rates that MATLAB, like it's like the, that the code spits out at you. Like those are based off a single exponential. Right? 
Um, I let me double check that. No, uh, we will figure it out right now. We cannot wait. Thank you. Your call will be disconnected. That's why I do not think anyone is connected from outside. Thank you, Aaron, for bringing this up. So, um, So let's uh, let me the let's let's go there. So we do have. Uh, energy of electron as function of time right which uh, equals um, if, if we assume that at uh, time infinity it goes to zero then it is initial value and then it, it relaxes exponentially right mm -hmm. so if one practices that we de divide this by uh, initial value it will be dimensionless and then one can practice time derivative then it, uh, by taking derivative, the rate will come up front, and it will be exponential. If you set up, if you take this derivative and then evaluate it at time equals zero, this exponential will become what, and it will be the rate. So it is one one way which is mathematically correct, but in practical implementations, there is a, a lot of numerical noise if you use Greek points, and it is not what the code is doing. Although, uh, philosophically, Kevin is correct. Differential way to extract uh, the rate. Now, uh, let's do a little exercise. In calculus, we were taught two operations, differentiate and integrate. What happens if you integrate this equation? Uh, from negative infinity to positive infinity? Mm -hmm. for, for the whole trajectory. It would diverge. No. Why? If it is uh, if it is just exponential, decreasing exponential, it is not like raising. It's exponential with minus sign. Oh, this is from zero to in infinity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, seeing what happens if I integrate it, do you want me to literally solve the integral analytically? Yes, or you can watch. Uh, uh, me doing it, okay, <laughs> or find errors, which I uh, typically do. So if you integrate exponential, you just uh, submerge the, you, you change the integration variable, make it k times t, okay. and in order to compensate it, you divide, uh, you divide, uh, you put uh, constant one over k, all right, up front, 
and then uh, integral of exponential is, is exponential, right? Yeah. And then you put the limits. Okay. Infinity and zero. All right. At infinity, e to the power of minus infinity will be zero, right? Right. At uh, zero, it will be one. All right. And then the minus and minus one compensate. So on the right part, you just practice uh, integration of exponential. Okay. On the left part, you have integral of your energy as function of time okay. along the whole trajectory, and you get one over t p. All right. So if you swap it, then you get the rate of relaxation is one divided by integral of uh, energy over the whole trajectory. Okay. And it is what implemented in the code. So what what you have in, in your poster is not wrong. But it would be more precise to put this equation, or keep both of them. Does it address your question? Mm -hmm. More questions to to give. How many blue pens do you have for the signatures? Oh. Uh, how many tokens do I have? Just count them on, on your figure. One, two, three, about four tokens. About four. <laughs> then from the relaxation diagram, it seems just one penalty is involved in the relaxation process. <coughs> so I can speak up. I guess from the relaxation, from the blue figure, it seems just one element is involved in the relaxation process. Oh, uh, right. What happens to the other one? Why there is no contribution? Try to put them that will contribute. I'm not sure. Okay, what, what, what do you mean then? Uh, so everything you do here basis uh, it rests on the orbitals, right? Right. And uh, these space uh, regions here, um, they, they it, it cannot be literally on the dopants. Same like in the work of Aaron, even uh, localized uh, polar run is uh, um, occupies several atomic orbitals in the vicinity, and here. The uh, typical orbitals are in between of these two iodines. So, in the space region of the material which is doped by iodines in general. So, it, it is not localized on a single iodine atom, it is in the vicinity. And it should be interpreted th this way. Um, right now, we are doing a uh, very serious approximation, all of us, uh, which we may decline with years, and it was a plan to decline with years. Right now, initial condition is one electronic orbital and one whole orbit, which is very comfortable and easy to think about. But generally, if we excite system with certain wavelengths, it uh, creates superposition of several electronic and several whole states. So if you would do this approach, the distribution will be more uh, distributed, more smeared out. And then uh, this artifact of that seemingly uh, localization of uh, one uh, um, dopant will disappear. So two, two things. Uh, it should be not on the iron, but in the vicinity, and second, there could be an artifact of the oversimplified initial conditions. Initial con uh, more generally, initial conditions should be uh, superposition of several orbitals. Do you buy it? You follow? Okay. More questions to Kevin? Okay. Let me ask. Sure. So, um, 
here your main hypothesis is your uh, uh, specific form of relaxation as function of uh, energy and uh, temperature. And here you have, you show energy offset, and here uh, work, and you see linear uh, dependence, right. which is fine. And here you are exploring dependence on temperature, which mm -hmm. is also great. But you are uh, just uh, literally using the output of Excel, and it is very hard to interpret like what is y, what is x. And how does the result of your fitting this 4.1 or uh, 4.02 relate to your A capital and alpha lowercase? Okay. You need to provide a dictionary somewhere. How to interpret what is y, what is ln x, and where, how does this number that you get through fitting cor uh, corresponds to your A capital and, and, and alpha? Uh, let me show something that, um, so please focus on uh, on the other screen uh, there, there, there. Yes. so in the lower uh, panel you show something like y equals four times logarithm x and in the abstract you tell that rate is uh, constant a times exponential minus delta e over Boltzmann t. All right. So how to correlate between symbols in this equation and symbols in this equation? Like what is y, what is x, what is 4? Uh, if you can answer right now, okay. If not, uh, you can uh, think in uh, when you're calm. And okay, wait. So. So I would just divide this by both sides by a, and then to take the, the natural log of, of both sides, uh, and then I'd <coughs> I desire divide uh, can, one side. Can, can, you're probably right, but it is machinery. It is your uh, individual intellectual laboratory. As a user of your intellectual product, uh, audience wants to hear the answer. Okay. So like. Definition: What is y and what is x in here? So likely x is uh, temperature. Okay. But uh, let's write it: x equals t. But then, well, um, it, it will take a little time to to find these correlations. And um, if I am trying to do this uh, log procedure to your main equation. Here. So uh, logarithm of rate divided by logarithm of, of your A constant up front will be minus uh, energy of set divided by KT. Okay. Right? So 1 over T is uh, a declining function, but minus 1 over T is a raising function. All right. So maybe. Uh, Hold on, I'm going to use the bathroom. Please, please. So why, why uh, this is like it can be fitted with two lines? Uh, I'm talking about why. Please, uh, I will try to answer my best, but uh, you may ask Kevin because he will be standing in front of. Uh, Are different data? Yes. So there are five times four, 20 data points, 20 rates. So four rates uh, for each of the value of uh, oh, different, temperatures. different values of temperature. So there are five values of temperature, and for each of them, there are five data points. They are not much different. They they quite coincide, and uh, it looks like he's doing four lines to fit to fit the progression of this uh, each, each each of the sequence. Can you please repeat your question so that Kevin will try to answer it himself, and then I will continue my comment. Uh, 
Huh? Just formulate a question. We need to help uh, Kevin to train to answer. Okay, my words. question was why you are fitting this uh, exponential type of uh, fitting, not a uh, straight line. You can use two two straight lines, but yeah. Uh, for which one? This one or this one? Lower ones. Uh, I guess. Uh, because well, when I look at this, it seems to me that it doesn't really fit, fit a straight line, and it fit, that it would fit an exponential more. I mean, uh, you can you can fit up to three points with one straight line, and the other points with another straight line. I mean, I'm talking more about the lower left one. That's uh, right one. Um, then I think you can explain with the energy plus one. Exactly, you are answering your own question. Is what oh, yeah, that, that, that's why I was talking about this straight line. You, you, you understood her question? Uh, no. She's uh, uh, asking if this data would agree with your original uh, hypothetical work. I mean, it, it, it should, right? Because these points uh, fit, uh, fit uh, an exponential curve. OK. I, I agree with you. But, uh, um, but uh, for first uh, few lines, it looks like they are related pretty faster compared to the uh, the y y axis yeah. is low is logarithmic. Do you see? I still I think a couple of them will fit the, the gap. Mm -hmm. If the electron relaxes from higher state, they will relax pretty fast. But well, um, it is summary of the data that uh, Kevin obtained. So uh, we we can disagree with numerical results, but we can change them. So uh, we are doing just fair science and re reporting what what was computed. Uh, let me continue my uh, comment. So if we take uh, the gap flow in in this form of uh, uh, negative exponential, right? Mm -hmm. And then practice the logarithm, like divide k over a, and apply logarithm to the left and right. Then uh, there will be uh, logarithm of um, rate is minus energy offset by, by temperature. All right. And one over temperature is declining function and. Uh, Minus one over temperature is uh, increasing function. So maybe in, in this, uh, uh, from this point of view, one may try to fit this function as uh, minus one over over time, or at least explain like why uh, it goes non-linearly. Okay. How does it depend on temperature? So it, it depends, like, it, it, as inverse of the uh, minus inverse of a temperature. Okay. If you have a type of shared domain. And then if, uh, if it is um, correct, then the slope of, uh, of your, uh, of, this, of this line is uh, energy offset divided by Boltzmann constant. Okay. But please think about it. Try if uh, more equations are needed to explain what is y, what is four, what is what is x, and uh, tell if this data are sufficient to uh, that uh, to state that the gap law is uh, is correct. All right. And uh, if it is your feeling, you may also interpret tell what is this r square and uh, how to. How to um, 
correlate this R square constant with the quality of, uh, of your feeling. So up to this precision, Van Gaplor maintains. Okay. More questions to Kevin. Any any suggestions what can be added to uh, to his poster? If no, let thank Kevin once again. So uh, Kevin, please collect uh, feedback right. and uh, try to carefully read it and, and uh, implement as, as possible. So it would be really great if the uh, final versions of, of posters are ready by midnight tomorrow, Wednesday, so that there will be two days for printing. Uh, if, and I will make arrangements so it will be uh, paid and, and printed on uh, fabric so it is easier to transport. Anything else to, to discuss? If no, then uh, uh, well, David, you, you don't need to, to do it with one day. You can relax and prefer an update for a little longer time. Unless you really want your poster to be presented this year. Then you decline all other activities and rush. <laughs> um, there will be no meeting <coughs> next week. Well, there will be a meeting maybe between Aaron and myself, and Kevin will be still here, but not no meeting. And we, in two weeks, there will be, a, um, with high probability, there will be a guest speaker, the uh, potential experimental collaborator, who will uh, share the challenge for where we can um, contribute our skills to solve real chemistry problems. And uh, in addition to this, Upon return from uh, Senegal, the authors who uh, will present themselves will just uh, implement, uh, will probably share the feedback if there will be some interesting. So while presenting, uh, try to make notes or uh, wait uh, after, right next hour after you. So finish your presentation, just uh, sit in the hotel room and write down questions and your answers, because it's most valuable uh, part of the conference. Uh, for those authors who are not traveling, I will try either to do this task myself, or if uh, Aaron will help me to present, maybe he'll take an heroic effort to do it. And the third option, probably will just take a uh, cell phone and uh, recording mode and record anything that will be spoken about your posters. And uh, after turning back, the idea is that we will use uh, feedback from the posters as an input to convert the uh, presentations into papers. <coughs> it is uh, splitting them as we did in the previous year, chopping on the like, sections and doing collective uh, editing. Thank you much for your dedication discussions and helping each other. Meeting is done and uh, have a nice two weeks and to those who travel have a safe.